I am here by myself. My family wanted to come, just didn't work out for them to come, and my wife especially um, wanted to be here. I was actually, my wife just loves Brother Paul's ministry. People got, have, if you're allowed to have favorite preachers, Brother Paul LaFontaine is my wife's, and one of mine, but favorite. In fact, I was supposed to get your autograph, Brother Paul, I think. I'll get that, uh, and a selfie also for Brother Paul. So well, I'll, be, I'll be sure to get that. I know she's streaming, so she's getting a good laugh with her face red right now. Amen. You love the Lord? Amen. Certainly do appreciate Brother Paul and the church here and his friendship over the many years. Uh, just uh, even as a young man, his ministry had such a great profound effect on my life and I'm sure the life of many others in the ministry of this church. Amen. Those of you that minister here, amen. I just pray that this weekend would just be an encouragement for you. Amen. I know that there's any time, there's any type of meetings or special services or you invite someone in, there's, there's a work that goes into that. So I pray God would pour back into you uh, twice, threefold, amen, what you've put in and blessing and bless you, amen, with his word. Judges chapter 13, and I just want to begin reading here. We're going to just begin reading here at verse 1 and read a few verses. I'm going to minister to you tonight on something that the Lord just uh, quickened to my heart even right before, just there in the back office and uh, just wanting to wait on him and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. You believe that the Lord has all things in control, even the little small details. You know the Lord is in the small little details. Go read the book of Leviticus when God tells Moses how to build the tabernacle. It wasn't generic. It wasn't just build me a building, build something nice, build something beautiful. But God was very detailed, specific engineered exactly the way I've, don't, don't deviate Moses from any part of it. Build it exactly as you see it. The colors, the jewels, the, the vessels, the, th- how the, the, the measurements down to the very inch, to the centimeter. You know what that tells me about God? God's not generic and there's not just a generic way that, that pleases the Lord. But I believe that, that God is very specific. He's got a specific heart and I believe the Lord's in the smallest details of our life even in the simple things. And so tonight, we just want to minister to you something very simple upon our heart, and I'm going to title this The Value of the Spirit. The Value of the Spirit. Verse 1 of Judges chapter 13. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. Verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God, notice this, from the womb, So in other words, God's purpose for your life didn't begin when you gave your heart to the Lord or when you caught the revelation of the message, but God's purpose for you actually started before you ever breathed your first breath. And he made a promise and he had a vision and he has a plan. And long before you ever came to be or ever came to your first struggle, God already charted your course from the cradle To the grave. How many believers we have here that would believe that? For lo, the the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. The woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible, which is our English word, and actually the word there is awesome. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, and she repeats the words. But notice what this mother says here. Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. How powerful is the purpose of God when God purposes something in a life in so much that God's purpose never left Samson's life, even though Samson left God's purpose. 
Notice here, then the Manoah entreated the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Let's just bow your, our heads together. Maybe if you have something upon your heart that you just want us to pray about, maybe here tonight before, you just want to raise a hand and say, Lord, come and meet my need. You just want to hold that hand up to the Lord right now. Lord Jesus, Father, you see our hands, Lord, that are up. My hands both, Lord, right now. God, I just, at this moment, Lord, there's nothing in me, Lord Jesus. I think of myself standing here. Lord, and who am I, God? Just nobody. Lord, and have nothing in myself, Lord, that I could give anybody, Lord, that would be of any kind of eternal benefit. Lord, I can say like David, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Lord, I just right now, God, surrender my vessel. Lord, the words that I have upon my heart, the thoughts, Lord Jesus. Father, and I come subservient now, Lord, to your spirit, Believing, Lord, that it's in this place, Lord, a place, Father, that's been energized by singing and by worship and by, Father, a spirit of faith, Lord, that is in this building. God, I pray, Lord, that you would come down, reach down, Lord, to every hand that's went up. Behind those hands, Lord, is a need that's represented. And I pray, God, that you would come and meet the expectation of that heart. Lord, you know what we have need of long before we can even ask. And God, I didn't even know I would be preaching this here today, Lord. I'm not prepared per se, Lord, as I would want to be, but I've just obeyed you, Lord, and I pray, God, that you would come and use my vessel, Lord, as I would just open my mouth, Father. I pray that you would use me, Lord, as a weapon of warfare to tear the devil's kingdom down. May it be, Lord, granted to each heart, each mother and father and young person, old alike, Lord, that's here, grant it to us now, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. It's an amazing scripture you read here in Judges, and we're just going to read just a few uh, more portions of scripture here and then uh, come to a thought, but I would just like to minister to you here just for a moment on the value of the Spirit. It's a powerful thing when you think of the life of Samson and you think of the purpose that God had placed in his life even before Samson was born. God had already predetermined a purpose in his life. And he had already, long before he was born, God had already ha had the gifts that he was going to pour in this man's life. He comes to his mother and father, and he makes them a covenant, a promise, and says, you're going to conceive. You know, Israel had been in backslidden in sin, and they, the Bible says that they were oppressed by the Philistines, but... The reason the Philistines were oppressing them is because a lifestyle of running from God and disobedience to the Lord had brought the Philistines upon their life. And now God was going to bring them a Savior. This is the word that the Bible uses for judges. In fact, if you read that, what the Bible, the Jewish Bible, that's the word that it uses, is that these were judges, not in judicial terms of a judge who presides over a case, but actually the word is Savior, that God would begin to save them from their oppressors. It's the same word we use from, for Jesus, is that He would be the Savior, but He wasn't just coming to deliver us from oppressors, but from sin, the real oppressor of humanity. But Samson was a, a Savior. He was his, this was the purpose of his life. That God had long before He came to, to be and God had already purposed something. He'd already planned it. He'd already uh, orchestrated it. Or you could say He charted it out from the cradle all the way to the grave. And God said, I'm going to anoint this man's life. I'm going to... I'm going to have a special purpose for this man's life. And I've already got all of the junctures and all of the crossroads and all of the decisions. I've already got them all mapped out. And you know, long before you ever come to a decision, God already has a place and has a way for you to take. 
God already has a perfect will and a perfect plan. He's not aimlessly in heaven trying to figure your life out and just up there randomly and I wonder what they'll come out to be and I wonder what kind of value I could get out of their life and I wonder what kind of purpose I could bring from them. But I believe that God puts you in a place specifically in a state, in a city, in a school, in a family, in a church, in a condition, and maybe a hard circumstance that you don't even understand. But let me just preach to you for a moment and say you're equipped for the job that God has in your life. Whether you feel equipped tonight or you feel you don't have the instructions, Brother Branham said, and why Christ speak? God, a man, God puts in a man the equipment for his life. He's born with the equipment already inside of him. And so there's nothing that happens in our life that makes God nervous. There's nothing that gives him stress or, or worry or anxiety. He's never second guessing his purpose that he placed in your life. You notice even all the way through Samson's life, no matter where he went, God never second guessed the decision he made to pick Samson. He never second guessed the decision to pick David. He never, when David fell with Bathsheba, God never second guessed or thought, I've made a mistake or, or there's been some catastrophe that's happened and oh, I've got to abort my first plan. But let me just say this, God already gave you the, the, the answer to your problem. The solution is already here tonight. And he's not up there worried and wondering and stressful and worried about how it's happening. I don't care what event you want to give me tonight. World events. Uh, who's in the White House? Who's going to be in the White House? Listen, it's not human votes or people's votes that puts a leader uh, over a country or over a nation. But God said, I raise up a nation and I bring down a nation. I'll raise up a leader and I'll bring down a leader to accomplish his purposes. Even Brother Branham in the message countdown begins to say that even meta, even uh, science has achieved great achievements. But did you know, Brother Branham said, even the, all the achievements man has ever accomplished, God was the one who put it in the heart of mankind to accomplish that achievement. He takes the horse and buggy, and he says it was a great achievement by man. Now, I don't understand how the horse and buggy, or, or I'm sorry, not the, 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 you know, the horse and buggy with a, a buggy with wheels, and you say, my goodness, you know what, that's, that's, a, that's an achievement? A wheel is an achievement? Well, to God, it was a great achievement. That man learns to transport himself. And he says, then God goes further. And, and he says, and then man discovers the automobile and the combustion engine. And he says, but notice each time man was achieving something, it was only representing that God was wanting to release something to his church. And so man would understand combustion engines and man would understand all of flight and, and, and travel by air. And then they would, uh, they would, they would understand, they would, they would discover the astronaut age. But Brother Branham said all those were measured by something God was doing. Come on, you know the message. It was something God was doing in his church. That's why the prophet says just about the time the Wright brothers were taking flight and getting up off the ground, there was a little group of people in Azusa Street in California that was starting to spiritually come out, out of this dimension and move up into the upper atmospheres. And so you see, nothing happens that takes God off guard. My, if that revelation would ever drop into your heart, it'd do you some good here tonight. Do you realize nothing ever happens? Nothing ever stresses him out? Uh, for God, actually, it's already taken place. That from the beginning to the end, history is just God's story. We break it up and say it's his story. That's exactly what it is. The prophet of God would call it a drama. And so there's actors to that drama. There's people that play certain parts to that drama. And God already anointed the evil, and he already anointed evil leaders. He anointed Pharaoh. He anoints uh, uh, evil nations. He anoints good men. He anoints bad men. They're all controlled by his purpose. And so nothing happens for God that takes him off guard. It's like watching a rerun. It's like watching a rerun. For God, everything's already taken place. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. That's why God never gets discouraged when you get discouraged. That's why God never loses faith when you lose faith. Because he already knows in the end, it doesn't matter what it looks like right now. 
in the end, they're going to be an overcomer. It's like watching a, a ball game. You ever watched your family, been with a person who's watching their favorite team? You know, and they get so wrapped up into a sport and wrapped up into their, you know, their champion, whoever it is. Uh, you know, whether it's, I don't care what sport you like here in football or basketball or, or no matter what it is. And they get so wrapped up in that team or that person or that whoever it is that they're, they get so stressed out. The further uh, victory and the further that team goes in the tournament, the more the stress level goes up and higher. If they would have just lost in the first round, I would be okay. But now it's getting closer. Now we're down to the semifinals. And, and boy, when it comes to the final, I don't care what, what, what it is, man. You know, some of those people, they can't even be in the room to watch the game. They're, they're so stressed out. The biggest, most moments, that, that the most highest, you know, most, what would be the most exciting crescendos and, and, and the most excited moments. And they can't even watch it. I, I don't even want to see it. Just, just turn it off. And they'll walk out of the room. I've been with them before. I was at a restaurant one time ordering some takeout food. And man, I walked in that place and it was dead silent. I was like, what in the world is going on? There's there, you know, I don't know what's happening. A restaurant that's usually loud and, and, you know, shaking. The walls are usually shaking and it's dead silent. And I walk in there and I realize there's TV screens and everybody's just glued to this big college football game. I don't even know who it was. It was a big championship game. And you can just feel the tension. And the stress. And before you know it, people were getting up, walking out. I don't even want to see it. I don't even want to watch it. And I just walked out of there and I thought, wait, here's your team. They've made it to the final moment. Here's the big game. Here's the big moments. The fourth quarter, there's only a minute left. And you don't even want to watch it? They're under so much stress. They're under so much anxiety. But you ever watch that same game with the man who's watching the rerun of the game where his team won? It's a completely different atmosphere. It's a completely different feeling because he already knows what's happened. He already knows in the end, his team won the game anyways. Oh, friends, if you could ever get a revelation of the backside of the book, that in the end, you've already won. Your team already won the game. That means it doesn't matter when he fumbles the ball. It doesn't matter what happens in my life. God's put a purpose in my life. So it does, my present condition doesn't matter. Because <laughs> in the end, I'm going to win. Can you say amen tonight? So Samson's, Samson's life is anointed long before he ever comes, long before he ever breathes his first breath. He's already got a perfect course, a perfect, a perfect uh, uh, a charted course that God's already made for him. You know, life is an amazing thing from the cradle to the grave. And let me say it this way. Life is an array of choices. You have choices that are large, and then you have choices that are smaller. And Samson's life was a life that was made up of some big decisions and some very small decisions. And ultimately, it was Samson's choice on what he valued or what he considered important, and that would be what he prioritized in his life. You know, you will always prioritize what you consider valuable. Can we be practical here for a moment? You will always prioritize or put emphasis on the things that you consider to be valuable to you. And you know, if, if a certain person values a certain thing, and maybe you don't share that same value. It's sort of like art. You know, I don't, I don't value art. I don't understand art. I guess modern art, that's when you understand it is when you don't understand it, I think, Brother Paul. But I don't, I don't understand art. But you take a person who understands and they value that. And I, I look at some pieces of artwork and it's shocking that the price. And here's people that are bidding it. At a, you know, an auction and, and the price has gone from five to seven to ten thousand dollars and twenty thousand. I'm thinking, oh, it's just a painting that a certain person painted and, and it doesn't make sense. It's just a blob of, of, of colors and to me it, it doesn't look like nothing. But do you know that a person who values that, they can see the value in it and they'll give, they'll give money that they'll, they'll, they'll go on a search. They'll, they, they, they hold that place in high regard and high esteem because they value it. 
And so Samson's priorities were controlled by his values. Values are such an important thing in our life. And so his life starts out in Judges 13. You can read it here and and we're we're just going to turn. If you have your Bible, turn there with me and we're just going to read a couple, paraphrase a few things, but uh, go through this maybe uh, slowly. So let's just read here. She conceives and has a son. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah. Now notice, so it's very evident and very clear that there was a season in Samson's life. There was a, a, a time frame where the Spirit of the Lord was moving upon Samson's heart. There was, a, there was a time in his life where he valued the Spirit of God. He valued the gift that God had placed in his life, and he operated under that anointing that God had placed upon him. So we know that there from the Scripture that, and the Bible doesn't, in Judges, it doesn't cover every little detail, and we don't really know how many years elapsed unless the Bible tells us that. We don't know the time frame of how much time elapsed between chapter 13 and chapter 14. But we do know that there came a point in Samson's life where he's he's making decisions. He's making choices. And from the time that you're you're very young, you begin to make uh, choices in your life. And you have responsibilities. and, And choices are so important. So important. The choices that we decide, the things that we decide, every decision... And whether it's a large one or a small one, ultimately, it's every choice in our life that holds a certain consequence. And and whether that's a good consequence or a a bad consequence, even the things that we listen to and the friends that we choose and the, the, the things that we allow to enter into our homes or into our lives, into our minds, The very little things, I'm getting down just to the very small things that we choose, where we choose to live, what church we go to, where we choose employment. We have to make these decisions. What we choose to do with our time. You see, Brother Branham says, God cannot push us through some kind of little pipe and put us on the other end and and then say, blessed is he that overcometh. Brother Branham says, what kind of overcoming would that be? You didn't overcome anything if he just pushed you through a little pipe on the other side and just pushed you through. But the prophet says, but you've got to make the decision for yourself. You see, there there comes a time in your life when God is not going to no longer push you. He's no longer going to unction you. He's no longer going to press you. He's going to leave the decision to you to make the choice. Reminded of Brother Branham's vision over his life through Danny Henry and the prophecy that's spoken out. And and it says, because you chose the harder way. And it was the path of your choosing. And he says, behold, it's my way. There's a great portion of heaven. Not on earth. Because sometimes the choices that we make don't bring heaven to earth. Oftentimes they bring discouragement and tor- and sometimes uh, in our life they bring great adversity. And so in the larger grand picture, what we find is after you look and you see a trajectory and you see a graph of the, from the beginning to the end and, and what you find when you sort of zoom out from the grand picture of life or zoom in, you find rather... That you see a life that was made up of a choice after choice after choice after choice. And then those small choices turn into a pattern. And then that pattern leads to a certain trajectory. Maybe an ebb and flow in a life. And ultimately your final destination of where you end up in life or eternity will simply be the result of choices you made. And so you can look at your life now and you can understand that you've arrived at the spot where you're at now, whether you, whether, whether you like it or you don't like it, whether it's good or bad, whether it's peaceful or stressful, whether it's joyful or sad, you've arrived 
at the place in your life and your ultimately your destination and where you've arrived is based upon the choices you've made. Very natural. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking here for a moment. Very natural choices. I'm not talking about ethereal things and spiritual things even per se. But, you know, sometimes serving the Lord is not some great ethereal kind of, you know, spastic thing that's just, you know, overflowing all the time with jitter. Sometimes serving the Lord is a very natural, simple. It's the very little simple things that you choose to do when you don't want to do it. And so Samson learns this, as the Bible said, God anoints his life. Now, we know that he wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost uh, in the sense of how that we're filled. But he was filled very much like other men. Even David in Psalms 51, when he prays, I pray that your Holy Spirit not depart from me. And you have even John who was filled with the Holy Ghost from, uh, the, you know, his, uh, but, but the Bible says in John uh, chapter 7, it, it speaks of the Spirit. And it says, he that believeth after me shall... Out of his belly flow rivers of living water. And if you read in your, your Bible in parentheses, it says, but he spoke of the spirit which had not yet been given. So we know that the difference between a man like Samson or a man like David or a man like Noah or a man like Jonah, these men were anointed with the spirit of God, that there was an anointing that came over upon their life. This was the breath of God. This is what the word for breath means or spirit means in the Bible. It actually means the, the, the word is ruach, which is the wind or the breath. And man, God uh, breathed into his nostrils uh, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So this was the enabling power. It was the enabling force. It was the, the spirit of God. That, that was going to enable them to do things that no other man could do or to be things that no other man could be. It's what anointed prophets of God. It was the very ruach, the spirit, the breath of the living God. Job speaks of it and says the breath, the ruach of God is in my nostrils. You can, you can read this and it goes all the way through the Bible. It was, the, it was the life of God or in essence it was the spirit or the anointing of God that was upon Samson. You say, then what was the difference between Jesus and Samson? The difference was, is that Samson had just a portion of that, of, of that spirit where Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Jesus was going to be all that Samson and David and Jacob and Joseph and all of the mighty men of God. He was going to be all of those in one man. The Bible would say it this way. He had the spirit without measure. But Samson, we know, has the Spirit of God anointing his life. And, and so he's, he's filled. He's filled with the Spirit of God from, the very, from his birth. And, and, and it is a very special thing. I, I just am obeying the Holy Spirit here tonight and trying to be sensitive to, his, to, to the unction of the Holy Ghost. Let me just say this. It's a very special thing when God fills you with the Spirit. It's a very special thing when God anoints your life. And when God anoints the gift that he's placed in you, and I don't care in what capacity you serve, whether it's a mother to a child, let me just say that's a gift that God anoints in your life, and it's a very powerful thing. When God anoints, don't take that for granted. Don't let it become common. But it's a very special thing when God anoints Samson's life. And in the Bible says he's going to begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of their oppressors. And so we know God's people, the Bible says, were under oppression. And so Samson's going to come there. And he's an anointed vessel. He's a consecrated vessel. This is what the hair, the Nazarite vow spoke of, that the hair was, was, would be called the crown of consecration. And it was just an outward the, what, what the power was not in necessarily the outward uh, external substance or appearance, but the outward appearance was only the representation of a heart that was dedicated or consecrated to the Lord. That is what anointing is. You see, an anointing is not just a feeling that comes over your body. 
An anointing actually in the Bible, it is the word chuman, and, and it's actually simply, the very most simple definition of the word anointing is to smear or to rub with oil. It's just what it means. To smear or to rub. What does it mean when you would anoint a man? You were taking anointing oil and you were anointing that man. They would take a king who was going to be anointed to lead a nation and, and a prophet like Samuel would come over David and he would pour that anointing and that anointing would then come from that the promise of that purpose and it would anoint that man's life. So you say, Brother Matt, what was the anointing? The anointing was simply the transfer of God's purpose to a life. Let me say that again. The anointing, an anointing is just a transfer of a promise of Jesus. That's why we pray for you. And when the Bible says in the book of James, let them, let the elders of the church, let those that are sick amongst you, let them be anointed with oil. What are we doing when we anoint you with oil? There's nothing special about the oil. There's not so that you can get oily or have oil on your head. But we are representing a promise of Jesus and that anointing is to transfer that from the mouth of Jesus to the pages of a Bible, to the faith inside your heart, and that promise comes into your body. And so do you realize when a man was anointed, he was literally baptized with the purpose from Jehovah. That's why we sing the song, I am not my own, I'm bought with the price. So God, when God anoints a life, he's claiming that. He's taken his purpose. He's taken his, his, his anointing, with his, which is his purpose. And he anoints that man's life. And so that, that anointing would come over Samson. And it was a power. It was, it was a, a supernatural. A supernatural strength that would come over this man's life. That's why it means what it meant when he was born a Nazarite unto God. In other words, it wasn't going to be a vow that he took as a Nazarite vow. But Jesus was born the same way. John the Baptist the same. They were a Nazarite unto God. They were consecrated, holy, dedicated for the purposes of God. In other words, you say, Brother Matt, what does that mean? It means it's a person who says, Lord, I am making myself available I am making my body, my vessel, my mind, my mouth, my words. I want you to know, Holy Spirit, I'm making myself available. Amen. And so that, that Nazarite was available for God to use. Oh, I just want to say, Lord, I want to make myself available. I want you to know, Lord, I'm, I'm emptying myself. And I want to become available to your spirit. And when you make yourself available to the Holy Ghost, you've got to completely let go of all of your preconceived ideas, let go of all your ambitions, let go of all of your goals and your dreams and your plans. You see, when you want to be anointed of God and the Spirit of God comes upon your life, you've got to be anointed, you've got to be available to the Holy Spirit to use. Many times your plans and your dreams and your ambitions conflict with what God is wanting. And so God, God visits this man and, he, and he, he's, he has many victories that tonight we can read about. And so God is saying to Samson, I've laid out to Manoah, I've laid out the blueprints for his life. Even before he was born, I've laid out the path, I've charted the course and it was my plan, it was his plan, it was his calling, it was his anointing that God seen from the beginning all the way to the end. Right. Amen. And he never lost the vision of that purpose. Are you hearing me here tonight, church? No matter where Samson went, God never lost the vision for Samson's. We know the scripture very well, and I think it's in Jeremiah 29, and it says, For I know the thoughts that thou hast that I have for you, thoughts of not of evil, but thoughts of good, and to bring you to an 
expected end. This is word expected means an anointed or consecrated end or a pre-purpose, predestinated plan. God is saying, I know the thoughts. Here's the thoughts I've had towards you. Not of evil, but to bring you to an expected end. I've got a purpose for your life. I've raised, rose you up for a, such a time as this. And what the Bible is saying is that God charts the course of every life with specific details, purposes, instructions, and equipment for the job. Even Pharaoh was raised up for a purpose. Whether it was evil or whether it was good, Judas was raised up for a purpose. And let me just preach here and say God's family is raised up for a purpose. Listen to me, church. There are people that fulfill the church of Lady Asia that's lukewarm and cold and formal and powerless. And, but let me just preach and say that's not your scripture. That's not your anointing. You are not the cold, formal church of the end time. We are the overcomers of Lady Asia. And there is an anointing upon the word of God to bring that to pass in your life. And so he, he, he purposed it. He rose him up for this purpose and anointed him. And that was so powerful, you would think that just the anointing of Jehovah would be enough for a man's life. You would think that the anointing of the Holy Ghost that could take a man and give him some supernatural strength, that would be enough to bring Samson from the cradle all the way to the vision that God had of him. Surely, Brother Matt, Samson's life was a life that was so anointed that he never deviated from the purpose or plan of God. Oh, no. But do you see, even with all of that powerful purpose, man is still made up of memory, conscience, reasonings, imaginations, affections. And he has something so powerful that God gave him. Something called choice. The ability to choose for yourself. To choose, to make a decision, to decide. God gives man free moral agency. Judges 14, we'll just go through it very quickly. And he says, And Samson went down to Timnath, saw a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines, and came and told, up, and told his father and mother, said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me to wife. Boy, imagine if your children told you that, Mom. <laughs> then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren? Or among all my people that thou goest and take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistine? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Now let me show you something so powerful. Because to any believer, you would, you would, you would, it would be no different than Manoah. You'd be no different than this mother and father. And to say, I, I, listen, son, is there not a believer here? Is there not, is there not someone here uh, you, the, 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 amongst your own people that you've got to go and take a wife of the Philistines? Listen, it was never God's perfect will for Samson to take a wife outside of God's chosen elected people, Israel. It is never God's perfect will. Never. But notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says, verse 4, but his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord. So you mean God takes things that makes no sense to us. And God says, actually, I'm using this for a certain purpose and a certain special mission that you have no idea about. And if I told you, you wouldn't understand it anyway. So I'm going to keep it from you. Why couldn't God have sat Manoah down and said, no, Manoah, listen, don't say that. It's actually me. But God never tells him that. He keeps it from him. They didn't know it was of the Lord because he sought an occasion upon the Philistines. So notice this. We know the story that Samson goes down to this woman. We know the, the chaos that ensues and the collateral damage. And there's men that are murdered and the whole house is destroyed. And, 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 and we, 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 can, we can move on from that. He comes from there. And we come to Judges chapter 16. Just turn over in your Bible. Just a couple of scriptures. 
uh, Judges chapter 6, and I won't be long here tonight. Then when Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her and told, was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. They could pass him and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went with him, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. So you notice what you see here from the little preview of the Bible, just a little bit of Samson's life. You notice this pattern of, of making the wrong decision. And all the while, there's liars in wait waiting to destroy him the whole time. Even you just read about it there with this woman in Gaza, that there's, there's liars in wait and they're just waiting for the moment. They're waiting for the moment. Samson moves on from there. He lays till midnight. We don't know what went through Samson's mind there laying on his bed that night. Could maybe value and start to look at his life and start to take inventory of all of the decisions and all of the harm and all of the chaos that sin had brought him. And the Bible says he rose up at midnight and he's good. he has a great victory and there's a great victory and triumph. And then the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and, and he comes from that, you know, that most dangerous spot you can be in. That most dangerous cycle you can be in. Where the Holy Spirit brings such conviction to your life. And He gets your attention. And you begin to survey your own life and you repent and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. But the Word never really takes real effect down. It moves down maybe to the conscience and the memory. Maybe moves to an emotional realm. But it never goes down into that soul where real faith or doubt, really the real you is down inside of that soul. And so you find Samson just coming out of those tears and going right back into the lap of another harlot. And he goes on this cycle of sin and repentance and sin and repentance and sin and repentance and sin and repentance. Just a cycle and a cycle. You know, it's actually very typified in Samson's life you have on a, on a one single man scale of actually a representation of what the entire book of Judges was. It was just a cycle of repentance and sin. Repentance and sin. Repentance and sin. And actually, if you read the book of Judges, it happened seven times. And God would send a deliverer, and under that deliverer, they would repent. And the Bible says it this way. All the days the people lived holy unto the Lord all the days of the judge. But when the judge died, the people went back to the Perizzites and Hittites and Jebusites. And the Bible would say it that way. It would say as long as the, as the judge was alive, the people served the Lord. And as long as he was there, you notice, the, you notice what's so important. There's certain anchor points in certain people's life. And it's amazing sometimes when you dissect and you really pull back the layers of what's really holding people to the truth. You, you want to know where a person's anchor really is? Start removing some of those anchor points and watch what happens to their life. And you've watched it over and over again. If a grandpa or a grandma or maybe some pastor, and the grandpa's a pastor, and they're in church from the time they're young, and they're alone, the, you know, loving the Lord, serving the Lord, believing the message, believing the truth. But you know, if that person's never anchored, if, it, if his anchor and his faith is resting upon that one single individual, then what happens when you uproot and that grandpa passes away or that church falls away, and then you remove that anchor point from their life and they become like a boat floating down the tide. And that anchor point, when it's removed from his life, from their life, when that judge would die, it seemed like as long as that judge was there, the people served the Lord. They came close to the Lord. But then that man would die and then the Bible says Israel would slide back down into sitting and seven times they come through this cycle of death. And Samson's life is really just typifying a representative of the condition of God's family. And Samson goes and he goes further than that to Delilah. 
And, he, and here the entire time the parents are there and they're pleading with Samson and, and they're, 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 they're trying to get his attention. I don't know why I'm preaching this here tonight. I'm just obeying the Lord, so just stay with me here. I believe it's for somebody, maybe someone that's here tonight that won't be here tomorrow. I don't know. I leave that up to the Lord. The Lord does his, does his job and he does it well. And, and this mother and father are trying so hard to get his attention. Pastor's trying, the deacons are trying, the church is trying. You know, here was the problem with Samson, is all Samson seen was mom and dad. What he couldn't see was that mom and dad were actually vessels of mercy. They were vessels of mercy. They were roadblocks. They, these, these were hazard signs that God had put in Samson's life. Turn around. Do not enter. Go the other way. And flashing lights to say, you're going the wrong direction. Do not enter. Wrong way. And he put barricade, but all Samson could see was mom. That's just mom telling me. And that's just dad. That's just the pastor. And he just leans a little bit legalistic. And that's the only reason he's even saying those kind of things. I got this figured out and I can go my own way. And I, it's all right. It'll all be good. And he doesn't realize that those are vessels of mercy. Yeah, amen. Trying to say, turn around. Stop thinking that way. Bring that thought captive to the Holy Ghost. Stop thinking your thoughts will eventually develop your habits and your habits will develop your character and your character will determine where you go in life. Amen. And all he can see was mom and dad. He didn't know it was a barricade. Stop. Don't enter. Road closed. You know how many people would get in their vehicle and just go through barricade after barricade after barricade and road closed and flashing lights and do not enter. And you just go barreling through all of those and busting out signs and going down the road. Who would do that? But do you realize this is oftentimes what believers do when God sends warning after warning after warning after warning? And we just go through it and through it and through it and through it and through it. And his life eventually takes a turn as we know. And his eyes are put out. And he... He's, he's blind and he's shaved. We, 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 we won't cover the whole life of Samson here tonight. I'm preaching to you on the value of the Spirit. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 28. If you have your Bible, we're just going to look at one more man. Let's look at Genesis chapter 28. I'm just going to read here, starting at verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and of the God of Isaac, and the land wherein thou liest to thee will I give it into thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west. Now let's just move on down here to verse 16, uh, verse 15, I'm sorry. And behold, notice this promise of God. Notice, this is powerful. And behold, I am with thee. Now that's a powerful thing. That Jehovah is saying to Jacob, Behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all the places, the decisions, the choices. When you need to go right, I'm going to tell you to go right. When you need to go left, I'll tell you to go left. When you need to turn around, notice Jacob, I'm going to be with you at all the junctions. From the days of your adolescence to the days of young married life to the days of older and your children are teenagers to the time of raising small children to the time of grandparents all the way from the cradle to the grave. I want you to know my promise, Jacob, is a covenant. I will be with you Amen. in all the places whether thou go, I'm going to stay right beside you. Jacob, you're going to go a lot of places the Lord never told you to go. You're going to go down a lot of roads that God never told you to go down, but I want you to know my promise. I'm going to be with you no matter where you go. I'll be with you in all the good times, all the bad times, the times of sorrow, the times of laughter, the times of joy, the times of pain. I'm going to be right beside you this is how powerful 
the promise of God is in your life. That no matter where you go, I will be with you, Jacob. And will bring you, listen to the promise again to this land. I will bring you, I will bring you, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Jacob awoke out of his sleep. And he said, this is a powerful thing, the Bible says. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he anoints a stone and he takes oil and he begins to pour oil over the stone. And, he, and Jacob ra- rose up early in the morning, the Bible says, and, and he, put, he had a stone for his pillows and poured oil and he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of the city was called Luz. So he anoints this place. This is a place of dedication, of consecration. It's a very special place in his life. So vivid is the dream that Jacob wakes up out of his sleep and and he doesn't know what to do. He's just beside himself and he just knows that the Lord had done something so special. He takes oil, he takes the stone. There's nothing special about the stone per se. It had been there the night before, but now God had visited this place. And out of that place, he dedicates it. He memorializes it. You say, oh, you're just being emotional, Jacob. You're just getting all worked up. Listen to me later on in your Bible. You'll read that God points back at this stone and noticed what Jacob did to that stone when he anointed it with oil. You think God doesn't see when you take a stand and make a move for God? You think the Holy Spirit doesn't recognize that and mark that down in your life? And Jacob wakes up, he anoints the stone, he calls this name of this place Bethel. And he says, this is something special. It's a special place. It's a special memorial. No other stone could serve, could could have that anointing or that place or that atmosphere. It was something remarkable to Jacob. You know why? Because it was a reminder of something that he valued. It was a reminder that was valuable to him. That the Holy Spirit had, had, had moved upon him and so he pours this oil And he says, I'm going to serve you, Lord. I'm going to go from this moment and from this day. Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to walk with you. And God, you could say at this point, had anointed his life. But I want you to consider something. Though anointed, though a vision, though a purpose, though though a mighty experience that this man Jacob had. This same man takes his family, all of his children, And he brings them to rock bottom. Complete shambles and chaos. You say, how would a man under such an anointing, under such a power of God, and here God appears to him at Bethel, and he appears supernaturally in a dream, and he sees a ladder reaching from heaven to earth, and angels ascending and descending him sees the Lord and the Lord speaks and says, I'm with you. Jacob, I'm with you in all the places you go and I'll bring you again to this land that I've promised. I'll again bring it to, I'll bring you to this place. And so God, you know, you notice what God was doing. God was joining himself to Jacob. He was attaching his promise unconditionally over his life. He was adjoining. Listen, you think God didn't know what Jacob was going to do? You think God didn't know where Jacob was going to go? You think God didn't know the mistakes that this man would make? No, God knew every single one of them. But let me say, his promise was greater than all of his mistakes. His promise was greater than all of his difficulties. I said his promise that he placed over his life, it wasn't going to matter where Jacob went. God said, I'll bring you back to the place that I promised. I know that's so simple, but I think it's so powerful. I will bring you back here. I'm joining myself to you, Jacob. Jacob wakes up. Surely the Lord is in this place. I knew it not. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And then we go from that moment. He makes a decision. I'll follow the Lord. We go from that moment, 
and that experience. And we go 20 long years. Time elapses. Elapses so fast. Time just goes by like that. And they're this big, and you're that small, and then suddenly they're this big. And overnight it just seems, how, where did time go? What happened? But all through all of that, all of those years and all of those months, down to the weeks, down to the days, down to the hours, down to the minutes, there was a choice and a decision and a choice and a decision. And things in life were becoming valuable. And things in life were losing value. And things were becoming more important than other things. 20 long years. Years of trial and years of sorrow. Years of grief and years of trouble. You say, where was God through all of those years, Brother Matt, that Jacob was backslidden? And through all of those years that it seemed like Jacob just was completely lost. Where was God? Right beside him. After leaving Bethel, Jacob settles down and he's forgotten completely the glory of this first experience with the Lord. He'd become cold and backslidden and carnal and lustful. And, and so God in Genesis 31, notice this in Genesis 31. If you have your Bible, just follow closely with me. Genesis chapter 31, I'll give you just a minute for those that are using a Bible, I'll give you just a minute to get to that. In Genesis 31, it's powerful if you read it. Genesis chapter 31. And notice here what God says to Jacob. And, and God says here in verse 13, now this is after all of the years, 20 long years, and here God comes to Jacob. And he says, I am the God of Bethel. I am the God of of Bethel, but you're not in Bethel. Lord, he's not in Bethel. He long ago, long time before, had left Bethel. He's miles away from that experience. But notice God never would identify himself with Jacob's life out of the will of God. God can say, I am not the God of your sin. I am not the God of your backsliding. I am the God of Bethel. Where thou anointest, uh huh. so God's seen. Where thou anointest the pillar, where thou vowed a vow unto me, now arise, get thee out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred. What do you got to do, Jacob? Get up. Go back. Come back to the word, Jacob. You don't need to make a big deal out of it. Don't make a big fuss out of it. Don't let the devil complicate it and make it so uh, uh, complicated. All you got to do is turn around and go the other way. Get back to the word uh, of God, Jacob. Go back to Bethel. Get up. Go back. In other words, Jacob, remember, you anointed a, a stone. That was a special experience. Remember how I moved upon you. Remember how I spoke to you. Remember that moment. Don't forget it, lest you forget. How many times do you see that in the Bible? Uh, that the, the, the children of Israel would forget the ways of the Lord. And God would call their mind back to remember and say, say remember. Remember is a powerful thing. You'll either the devil will either use it to destroy you or God will use it to reignite your faith. Remember. Remember, Jacob. Remember where you came from. It's what Brother Random says in the Ephesian church age. And he talks about that Ephesian church that had left their first love. And Brother Random says, oh, evidently, something had left their mind. They had forgotten the glory and the wonder of their message. Remember, Jacob. Go back. Get up. Remember all of your promises. Remember all of your vows that you vowed to me. Go back to the altar. Go back to Bethel, Jacob. There's no power in this. There's no victory in this. Nothing can happen until you come back. I want you to notice that powerful principle. God will never do anything in your life while you're outside, living outside of the will of God, outside and backslidden, outside of the glory of God, God can never operate until you're willing to come back first. 
You say, then surely, surely, Brother Matt, Genesis 31, we're going to read the next verse, chapter 34, and it's going to say, Jacob packed up his family, got his camels, loaded them up, and he went back to Bethel. No, I wish I could read that, but that's not what it says. Instead, Jacob in Genesis 33 settles down in Shechem. And Shechem, the word in Hebrew, do you know what it means? It means two things. Going back, not back to Bethel, but backsliding. That's what, that's what Shechem means. And it means a place of burdens. Do you want to know what it means when you're disobedient to the Lord and you disobey the Lord and you go somewhere He told you not to go? Do you, know, you want to know what place we come to? We come to the place of burdens. And we lose blessing. And we get burdened. You know, there's a powerful thing when you live under the blessing of God. So powerful that you know when it's gone. Hello? So powerful that you know when the blessing of God is gone. And Jacob didn't have to look. He could kid himself. But he knew that something was gone. Something was missing. And at Shechem, we know the trouble he gets into. And his house is dishonored. His daughter's raped. And, and the, 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 the brothers come. And, and there's murder. And there's the, the, just complete chaos. And, and God, it just it becomes a place for Jacob because of the choices he makes. It becomes such a place of burden for Jacob. And yet, do you know that not one time did he relate his trouble to being out of God's will. To be in a place of, 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 of burden because he had disobeyed the Lord. No, he's very much like me, very much like you. The last person that we turn to, the last thing we do is to look introspectively at our own life. And the first thing we do is blame the pastor, blame mom, blame dad, blame this thing that happened in our life. The last thing we do is turn the light down on our soul and say, maybe, maybe I need to consider my ways. And he blames, could blame everything in life. And God comes to Jacob. I want you to notice this. Let me just say this here for a moment. Had I been God, because I won't put you there, you may not like it, I'll just put myself there. Had I been God... I can promise you when I came back after all of the times I've tried, all the trouble I've went through, after all of the times I've tried to get his attention, after all the times I've given him mercy and given him grace, man, I would have wanted to give Jacob a real licking, a real talking to. To say, my goodness, Jacob, what's it going to take? Really, I mean, come on, Jacob. What's it going to take for you to believe? What's it going to take for you to understand? What, when, when's your faith ever come on? You really here again, Jacob? Are you really here at another spot in your life, at another time after all the times I've delivered you, Jacob? You know what, Jacob? We're done. I mean, come on, man. I mean, really? Really, Jacob? I mean, give me a break. One time, two time, three time, four time, five time wasn't enough. I mean, really, Jacob, you know what? I've just made my decision. I, you know, you know, i got to call it quits with you. I've tried. I've really put my effort into this thing, and I really, you know, I've tried to be patient. I've tried to be caring. I've tried to be long-suffering. i tried to give you mercy, but you blew it this time, Jacob, for the last time. I am so glad my Heavenly Father has never spoken those words to me. He's never given up on me. He's never lost faith in me. In fact, quite the opposite. It seems the more I fail him, the more mercy and grace that I receive. That's why the song says it's an amazing grace. You say, amazing, Brother Matt, more amazing. Every day I serve him, his grace becomes more amazing to me. Never one time does he give up or turn, me, turn around on me or turn his back on me. But he continues to move. He continues to speak. 
He continues to preach. He continues to love. God never gives up on you. He never gives up on me. He never quits on us. Let me just tell you, I want you to get it in your mind. God is never going to give up on you. You say, what's it going to take for me, Brother Matt? How many times and how many years and how many youth camps and how many meetings and how many prayer lines? You say, what's it going to take? God will not stop. He will not quit. He'll keep pushing. He'll keep pressing. He'll keep preaching. God says, get it through your head. I'm never going to give up on you. I'm going to keep pushing and praying and pressing until you believe for yourself. I'm never going to turn around. I'm never going to give up. I'm never going to walk away. I'm never going to call it quits. I'm so glad that's the Jesus I serve. God, instead of chastising him in Genesis 33, Genesis, uh, sorry, 35, instead of chastising him, look at the words of Jehovah to a disobedient servant whose life was a mess. God speaks to this man in Genesis 35, very first verse, God said unto Jacob, Arise. Arise. Hold on, God. No, 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 no. No, you must have not seen what I see. Lord, you surely, you got to address that. You got to, you got to say something about that, Lord. Surely you're not just going to skip over all of it. Surely, Lord, Lord, you got to bring it up. You got to say something. No, God never even makes a mention. He just simply gives him the same word he's always gave him. Did you hear me? He gives him the same word that he's always gave him. He preaches the same message that he's always preached to him. He gives him the same words that he's already gave. Listen, God's word never changes. It's still the same message. It's still the same power. It's still the same anointing. Arise, Jacob. Go up to Bethel. I'm going to say the same thing I've told you from the very first time you made a mistake. Get up. Arise. Go to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, thy brother. Get up, Jacob. Get up, Jacob. How am I going to figure all this out? What am I going to do, Lord? I've came to such a place of failure. What do I got to do, Lord, to get back? Just get up, child. That's all you got to do. Get up, child. Sometimes we get in a rut in our life and that rut lasts for years. And it might have started as something in our life that something happened and then you get bitter in your heart or you maybe someone hurts you. You get a pain or a hurt from something or somebody or some circumstance and, and then you begin to get distant and then years go upon years and you forget even the reason why, you're, why, you, why you feel the, the apathy that you feel. You can't even explain. You're just in a rut and the, the, the devil just pours on and, and makes it more difficult and more complicated almost to a chasm that you, you can't even cross and it just is impossible for you to, to get back to God. Let me just give you the simple message of, of the Holy Spirit here tonight. You don't have to do anything except get up on your feet and say, God, I'm coming back to the altar. I'm coming back to Bethel. I'm coming back to dedication. All you got to do is come back. Like the little woman in the prayer line who comes up to Brother Branham and is so frantic and worried about her life. And oh, Brother Branham, I've, I've made so many mistakes and I'm so distant. Sister, Brother Branham just begins to, to discern her heart. He says, you, you want to get back to the Lord. You want to get right with the Lord. Is that yes, Brother Branham? Yes, I just want to get back. And she's so worked up. And Brother Branham just says, you're back. Notice, just like that, there's no, there's no great, there's no great kind of ego, a thing that she has to go through. You've got a desire to get back with God. God never left you. You might have left Him. You might have walked away, but God stayed right beside you. He was there through every decision, through every crossroad, through every junction. You want to get back with God? You're back right now. Rise, Jacob. Come back. Bethel. 
You know what Jacob did that time? He gathers up all his idols, all of his family. He gets rid- he takes all of his idols and he casts them. The Bible says gets rid of all of them. He cleans everything. He cleans his entire house. Jacob said unto his household and all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. God can do something so powerful with just simple repentance. With just simple, a a real, genuine, true repentance to say, God, I repent of my thinking. I repent of the ways I've thought before. I repent of yesterday. I want to be new. I want mercy to be new to my whole family. What do I got to do, Brother Matt? Cast out all of your idols. Throw away all of your your dirty garments. And repent unto God and come back to the Bethel. Come back to the altar. Doesn't have to be complicated. Only we make it complicated. We allow the devil to distort and twist our mind and bring so much guilt and so much condemnation. Listen, God never condemns you. He might bring conviction on your life, but he's never there condemning you and mocking your life. He's always there wanting you to come back. And Jacob throws it all away. All of his ideas. You know what? That's really what real repentance really is. Repentance is not a prayer that you pray. Did you know that? Repentance is not a prayer. Repentance is not words that you do. So many people think they've repented. You know, like like the man at the Bull of Bethesda who had been there 38 years, 37 years, an invalid, and he's laying there at, at the Pool of Bethesda And the Bible says that Jesus passes everybody. As Brother Random takes it so beautifully, passes everybody in that crowd and comes to this one man who had a need. And he's laying there 37 years. You know, you say, Brother Matt, oh, that's so unfortunate. This man was there for 38, whatever it was, 38 years uh, there, there in the pool of Bethesda. And he's laying there on a mat and he can't walk. He can't get up. He has no man to pick him up and put him in the water. And you know what's so, what's so amazing? You say, that's so pitiful that that happened. What bad circumstances. And Mishwar, no, 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 no. After Jesus heals this man, he says, now go and sin no more. So what does it tell you? What put this man in this condition? Sin. Because sin is destructive to your body, your mind, and your soul. It doesn't just destroy your soul. It destroys your mind. It destroys your spirit. It'll make you someone you never wanted to become. And he's laying there 30 some odd years. An invalid can't get up. Jesus comes to him. And Jesus asks him a very, the man gives his story. You know, every time I, 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 you know, I've come, Jesus walks up to him and he just asks him a simple question. Will thou be made whole? Very simple. Just cuts right to the chase. In other words, this is the question. Do you want to be made whole? And the man responds and says, Well, every year and the angel of the Lord comes to stir the waters and I have no man to pick me up and put me in the water. And and people get in ahead of me and in front of me and I I can never get in there. And and he gives this entire story, this long story of all of his, and Jesus just, you know what? Jesus never responds. Go read your Bible. He never replies to the man's long sob story. He just simply asks the same question again. Will you be made whole? You say, why, Brother Matt? You see, So many people hate the consequences of sin. The drunk, the alcoholic loves his alcohol, but he hates that it ruins his marriage, it ruins his job, he loses his license, he drives a moped. No one likes to drive a moped. Nobody, and and, and alcohol, they they hate what, they hate what the, 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 the torment that sin brings to their life. That drug addict, he loves the drugs, but he hates what drugs does to him. You notice there's a very big difference between hating the consequence of sin and hating the sin. And true repentance is not, notice Jesus never said, hey bud, man, does your back hurt? I can imagine laying there, you know, buddy, I mean, goodness gracious, you got to be in a lot of pain. 
Yeah, I, I'm in so much pain. I mean, goodness, I can imagine you got bed sores all over. Oh, buddy, I feel so sorry. Notice Jesus never asks any of that. You know, that alcohol really ruined your life. That's so terrible. And really, you hate that. Yeah, I hate, I hate what it's done to me. Listen, everybody hates the consequence of sin. But Jesus wasn't asking him, do you want to be free of all the trouble that the sin has caused you? He asked a very simple question. Do you want to be free from the sin? And there's a big difference in wanting the symptoms and saying, God, I I don't just hate the trouble. I want to be clean from the sin. I want the addiction. I want my mind to be pure, my body to be holy. I want to be, this is what real repentance is. When you hate the sin and you say, I desire holiness. I hunger for righteousness. I want the Holy Ghost, not because I'm tired of all the trouble in the world, but because I want the righteousness of God to clothe and robe me and take my filthiness away. Take my, take all of my dirtiness away from my mind, from my mouth, from my thoughts. I want to be clean. You ever get that way to where you just don't like you? Can we be honest here tonight? You ever get to the place to where you look in the mirror and you say, I hate, sometimes I just hate myself. I hate who I hate who I can become. I hate when I have a temper. I hate when I'm angry. I hate when I get a bitterness or jealousy or malice. You say, what is that? That's the Holy Ghost inside of you. And so Jacob says, I want to throw it all away. The Bible says he takes his everything and he gathers his family and he goes back to Bethel. You know what happens at Bethel? Jacob's restored. Jacob's healed. Jacob's made whole. And he washes away something so powerful about repentance. It washes away all of the past, all of the stress, all of the trouble, all of the guilt, all of everything behind you. You leave it all behind you. And Jacob washes it all away. And he comes back to that place of Bethel. God says, very powerful scripture. And I'm just going to close right here, just as maybe the musicians could come. We're going to close. It's 8 o'clock. Something so powerful in the book of Isaiah. Notice what he says here. Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yes, the Lord says, they may forget. Yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. And thy walls are continually before me. This word for walls, when he says thy walls are continually before me, is the word shoma, which literally means to be joined to a wall. It's the same as a brick mason who would lay a brick to another brick, and he takes mortar, he lays the brick to another brick, and he's joined, and it becomes one whole wall. Do you know this is what the promise of God that God makes in Isaiah? And he says, can a woman forget? Yea, they may forget. But I can't forget you. You say, how, Lord, why can't you forget me? Because you've got to understand, child, I've joined myself to you. I'm part of you. I've interlaced. When you're in prison, I'm in prison. In other words, when 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 you're crying, I'm crying. When you hurt, I hurt. Let me give you the New Testament language. He's a high priest who can be touched by the feelings of your infirmities. I want you to stand to your feet tonight and I want you to raise a hand and say, Lord God, would you be touched? Could you bow your head with me and raise those hands and say, Lord, would you be touched by the feeling of my infirmity here tonight? You know, he's a high priest who can be touched.
And maybe you're here tonight. You've heard this sermon that the Lord just, I believe, gave for somebody here. And I preach to you on the value of the Spirit. Maybe you came to a place and you're here tonight and you say, Lord, I, I can take inventory here under this little simple sermon and say, Lord, I've realized I've not always valued the right things in my life. I've not always put enough value and I've allowed maybe the devil or maybe through circumstances or through time I've not been able to value correctly the word in my life. That it's my daily bread. It's my portion. I've allowed things in my life like Samson. And maybe I've came unaligned or derailed from that purpose or that perfect will that you have for my life. But tonight, Lord, I just want to repent. And I want to say, God, I'm coming back to Bethel. I'm coming back to that place of blessing. I want to go back, Lord. I want, the, I want to go back to that place of blessing in my life where I know that I know that I know that I'm serving you in the center of your will and your purpose that you've placed over my life. Oh, how many believers' hands are going up everywhere would say, God, place me in the center of that will, oh God. Place me in the center of your purpose that perfect plan and that perfect course that you charted before the foundation of the world. Lord, I want to come to the center of it tonight. God bless those hands up everywhere, everywhere now. I just want to pray now with every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord Jesus, Father, you're the God in all times, the good, the bad, the times of low times, the high times, the seasons of our life that are troublesome, the seasons of our life that are happy. God, you're the God of all times, Lord. Father, as we've ministered here tonight, God, you have a place. You have a, a will, a desire, a purpose for our lives. I pray, God, that your word would find its mark here tonight. I don't know, Lord, why you changed me and turned my course around completely. But I'm just your servant now, Lord, and I've spoken the words that you've placed upon my heart. I pray, God, that your children now would become sensitive to the Holy Spirit speaking. Let it be, oh God. I want to say, Lord, if I have the wrong values in my life, I just want to raise my hand and say, Lord, I want to re -est. I want to. I want to evaluate everything, every decision, my habits, my places I go, the things I watch, the things I listen to the choices that I make, the friends that I choose, everything, Lord, I, I want to put it all on the table right now and take inventory right now, Lord Jesus. That's my prayer. God, if there would be anything in my life that would be unlike you, I just want to repent, it, repent of it tonight, Lord. This is what it means, Lord, when the Bible says that let a man examine himself to make our calling and election sure that if, if a man would judge himself, he wouldn't be judged. But when he's judged, he's chastened of the Holy Spirit. God, and that chastening is not a rod just of correction, not just a rod of, uh, Lord, uh, of, a, of a whipping, God, but it's a rod of correction to correct our ways and to correct our paths where we went wrong. Bring us back, Lord Jesus, I pray, I pray tonight. Grant it, Lord. Granite Jesus. We're going to tarry just here for a moment. And I'll turn the service back over to Brother Paul. Just let the Holy Spirit just move just for a moment. Why don't you just raise your hands to the Lord? Just give Him praise here tonight. Say, Lord, we worship You, Father. We place You in the highest place. We esteem You as the greatest treasure, the pearl of great price. We esteem your word as the greatest treasure you've ever sent to the world. It takes first place. It takes number one, God, above all else, above everything in our life. God, don't let us serve you out of a life just of, of do's and don'ts and a life of rules and regulations, but let it be, God, a relationship that's anointed. 
a real true experience of a life that's dedicated, a spiritual Nazarite consecrated unto God. As we dedicate ourselves to your service and to your life, oh God, it is surrender now, Lord. Anything that you want to say, anything that you want to do, any place you want to take us, any decision, Lord, you're looking for us to lay it down and that I want to lay it down. Don't let me hold on to it, God. You're telling me to let it go, that I want to let it go tonight, Jesus. I want to make a firm decision to say from this day, from this day on, I let it go. I mark it down. I'm going to, I'm going to, build, I'm going to do as Jacob. I'm going to pour oil over this spot, anoint it, God. Let me never leave it, Jesus, I pray. Ask it, Lord. What are you playing with? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 